the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. God has certainly been merciful to his people. We've had three cases at least where we could have lost some of the saints, but God spared us. I know the Bible says that uh, there's a time appointed for every man, but we certainly thank the Lord for sparing the lives of our sisters this past week. God is good. Amen. He good if he keeps us. He good if he takes us. He's just good. Amen. Um, quickly in the book of uh, Matthew. St. Matthew chapter number 6. There are some things in life that you cannot accomplish by approaching it, um, think half-hearted, maybe the right word that I'm looking for. When you start down the path of being holy, you have to have a single mind. You can't be, I'm going to be holy today and maybe tomorrow too. Then I'll take a break. You know how folks do when they're on a diet and they do real good for a week and they say, well, I've done so good all week long, I'm going to give myself a treat. Well, you can't be like that with holiness. You can't say I've been holy all week long, haven't done nothing wrong, committed no sin, so I'm going to give myself a treat and I'm going to go out and sin just once. You can't do that. You have to have a single mind about walking with God. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 24. No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and money. Now, the two masters is... The very idea of I'm going to be good most of the time and then give myself a break from being good every now and then. You can't do that. I know we've got some sports fans in here. How difficult is it to root for two teams in one league and you like them both? And they're playing against each other. You have to choose a side. If you're a true fan, right. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I suppose. <laughs> it's difficult to cheer for both sides. You pick one side and that's it. And there are people, a, a fan will stick with their team even when it's losing. Even when it looks like it's losing, they stick with their team. And, and, he, and here's the thing. Um, now, me, my team always wins because I generally pick after the game. I've got no particular allegiance. I'm all about winning. <laughs> if you can't win the game, I'm not on your team. When it comes down to your soul, you cannot play both sides of the fence. You cannot be on fire for God for a little while, then on fire for the devil for a little while, then on fire for God for a little while. It just doesn't work. And here he brings it around to this. You cannot serve God and money. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, this money thing is probably the biggest stumbling block of all. People might think, well, women or men might be the biggest stumbling block of all for, for the saints, for church folks. People that want to serve God, the opposite sex is the biggest stumbling block. Actually, money 
Money is, is hard on anybody when it's your priority. Verse number six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So there's another scripture that says, that talks about um, that there are some who feel that gain is godliness. From such, turn away. Now that's what, that's what they think. They think gaining things, possessions, is godliness. He said, leave them kind of people alone. But being godly and content, that's the kind of gain that we look for. What good does it do to be rich and you miserable? I mean, they can get up in the morning. Think, think you're rich enough that you can get up in the morning and say, I'm tired of looking at the snow today. I'll fly down to the Caymans. And pack your bags up and drive over, get in your private jet be flown down someplace where it's good, hot, and warm, and, and you can run around in your swimming suit, but you're miserable. Your wife or your husband is on your nerves, won't leave you alone. Won't just, everything is going wrong. What gain is that? But if you can be godly and happy, content, that's gain. All right. Because he, he explains it a little bit further. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothes, raiment, let us therewith be content. As long as you've got food to eat and clothes on your back, you should be content with that. So that does that mean that you shouldn't work to get more? No, but it means as long as I got that, I'm content. I know I've got what I need. He goes on, though, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition or trouble. Who's got trouble? They that will be rich, right? They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You know what he's talking about? When you have a lot, the snare is you learn many things. First, to trust your money. When a poor person that has no insurance gets deathly ill, what can they do? Say what? Nothing? Pray. That's all they can do. Pray. They look to God, don't they? But the multimillionaire, what do they do when they get sick? Get me the finest doctor money can buy. So we fall into this mindset that my money can fix things for me. Soon as they get in trouble with the police, get the, get the chief of police on the phone. I'll get this fixed right now. I've donated to his campaign. I donated to her campaign, get, the, get me the governor, because money fixed that for them. They fall into foolish and hurtful lust, foolishness. I can buy whatever I want with my money. Um, there's an expression, I don't know if it's athletes that do it or if it's singers, rappers where they say making it rain and they're doing that with the money. I've seen them on TV commercials doing that. That's foolish. You out, you out there with all that money and you just doing this. One guy said um, he was a football player. He said they went into some place and he spent like $75,000 in one night 
just buying drinks for folks. That's foolishness. By the time it was finished, he said, by the time I retired, I was broke. I said, you're right. He was making it rain. It was raining his money. What he should have been doing was saving it for a rainy day. Because by the time he was done with a career, he didn't have nothing to show for it. It drowned. The Bible says money drowns men in destruction and perdition. Why? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some while which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When you get greedy and you got to have money. Eventually, you'll lose your way with God. The most generous person is the one that's got $10. Come on, man. I ain't got but $10. Let's run down to McDonald's. Get us both a couple sandwiches and a drink. he take his last $10. The man that's got $1,000 will say, how much is ties on that? What? Ooh. I mean, is that New Testament or is that Old Testament? See, we start to thinking about it then. Because what I wanted to buy was uh, $999.99, and I need to borrow some money for the taxes. And somebody talking about giving $100 to the church? Are you kidding me? When you get up into the thousands of dollars, tired of my family calling me, all they want is money. Tired of people bothering me, all they want is money. I don't know who's my friend. I don't know who's speaking to me because of I got money or they just speaking to me because I'm, I'm a nice person. You, you don't know after a while. It, it's true. I met somebody famous one time, and they was trying to tell me who he was. I didn't know who he was. I'm just chatting with him. I had no idea. Went back later and looked it up. I was like, oh, he is famous. I just don't look at the kind of stuff he's in, the movies he's in. I don't, I don't look at those kind of movies, but he's been in a bunch of them. I didn't know him. I just sat and talked with him. But if I didn't know who he was, I might not have behaved like that. They're always looking at that kind of stuff because you don't know who's talking to you because they know who you are or who's talking to you just because you're somebody. You know, you're just another person. Let's just talk. You don't know. Money does that to you. Now, he says that the love of money, you get down to every single person Problem. All evil, you can trace it back to some money somewhere. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Corruption, doesn't matter. All of it traces back to what money can do. I was thinking um, not too long ago about the tobacco industry. To know that the product that they sell kills people. Why would you sell something that you know kills people? Then you go to the government and spend tens of millions of dollars to get them to not let people bother you because what you're doing is killing people. Why would they go through all of that? Money. I can take a human life or I can make money. I'll take the money. You see? So you can't serve God and money. You can serve God and have some money or you can serve money. Because when you serve money, you won't come to church. If it comes down to church or some money, I'm going to go make the money. 
I, I had a job one time, and the owner of the business came to me, told me he, when, I, when he hired me, 40 hours a week. It wasn't too long after that, emergencies kept coming up, and I was doing 15, 60 hours a week. Then it went to six days a week. And then it went to seven days a week. He called me in his office and he said, I'm sorry, but uh, right now we're we making this thing work and it's going to take being here seven days a week. I said, I can't do that. I'm already missing Bible class. I already missed saints meeting and prayer. I'm not going to miss Sunday church too. Said, well, you got to make up your mind whether you want a job or whether you want church. I said, well, thank you. That helped me. Took my keys out and put them on there. Took my beeper off and put it on his desk. He said, what you doing? I said, I've made up my mind. I want church. You can have your keys back. Here's the keys to your vehicle, to all other stuff. I'll get somebody to come and pick me up. But I am not going to be missing church. Walked away from the job. Seven days a week. Really? I was working 80-hour weeks, seven days a week, six days a week, and he wanted to bump it up to seven. I said, nope. I'm a good worker. I'm a hard worker. I ain't got no problem with working, but I'm not going to keep missing church. You cannot serve God and money. I could have easily said, well, I got to do what I got to do to make it work for my family. Nope. I left there and went and got a better job. Actually, I did. I got a better job. And I'm not saying that God chased me off of that to get a better job, but I did. I got a better paying job when I left. But the Lord knew my heart. I wasn't trying to be lazy. First Peter. Chapter four. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. I know a lot of times we feel like if we're having problems in our life, it must be because I did something wrong. I have to. Why would the Lord let all of these bad things happen to me? I must have done something wrong and I don't know what it is. And yet the scripture says, he that suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's why you're suffering, because you won't do wrong. If I can go ahead and steal something, it can relieve the burden. If they're getting ready to cut my gas off, getting ready to cut my lights off, my phone off or whatever, and I know there's some money over in the, in the little uh, petty cash box and don't nobody even know how much is in there. Well, I can take that money and just pay my bill and say that it got lost or no, I don't remember any money being in there and I know I won't get any trouble. Well, that keeps my, my, my uh, utilities from getting cut off. But if I'm living right, I might have to get them cut off because I just don't have the money. And I won't steal to get it. So there ain't no point in sitting back saying, well, why am I suffering? Because I wouldn't do wrong. He goes on that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. When you won't do wrong, with the group, they're going to talk about you. They do that. 
Now, I just want to jump back up to lasciviousness and lust. Because new saints need to know the difference between these two things. Lascivious and lust. Because lasciviousness causes something. Lust is doing something. If you see these men walking around with their shirts cut, ain't got no sleeves, and it goes all the way down to their waist on both sides, what are they doing when they got their shirts cut all open like that? Why do they do that? Oh, the sisters want to act bashful. <laughs> Trying to show their men pack, man pack, six packs. If you say it right, six packs. I got two or three six packs. Too many of them all stacked up on top of each other. They're trying to show you some flesh, aren't they? Their muscles. Why do you think they're doing that? Because they're so proud of their muscles? You think that's what they're doing? Huh? They want to catch your attention so you can see how big their muscles are? You say they just want you to look at them. Come on, for real, sisters. <laughs> well, then let me change it around. You see a woman walking around with her blouse cut way down to here. She got a push-up bra on, a skirt that comes up way above her knees. Why is she doing that? Because she just wants you to notice her? Is that what it is? She just wants you to notice her. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. He said, no, that's not why they're doing it. They want more than your attention. Exactly. They want you looking at them. They want you lusting after them. They like it when you're flirting with them. <coughs> Amen, somebody. They like that, and so do the men. They're wearing shirts like that because they want to see the girls looking at them making passes at them with hopes of something a little more than that is what they're looking for. One thing leads to another. Lasciviousness leads to lust. You're right. Lasciviousness is the what you do to make someone lust. For example, if you get a pornographic magazine it contains lascivious material. What is its purpose? To make you lust after them. When you dress in a way that makes people want to look at you of the opposite sex in a sexual way, that's dressing lasciviously. When somebody looks at you and says, mmm, that's lust. You see? Does that make sense? A saint doesn't dress or behave lasciviously. I, I can dress like I am right now, walk into a room of women, and the way I look at them can be very lasciviously. I'm letting them know I'm interested. And I'm interested in more than just a little chit-chat with you. They know that because of the way I look. That's lasciviousness. To sit back and think about what I'm going to do with her is lust. You cannot be lascivious as a saint and do this. They ain't got no business looking no way. No, you have no business dressing like that. No way. Brothers and sisters, because I have to deal so much more with men than women. It's crazy. I remember it was always the sisters, this, they're wearing their dresses like that. They're doing this, that, and the other, and they wanting to look like this. Now, boys is trying to, they best to show you their underwear. Crazy stuff. 
And I'm trying my best to understand how anybody can dress like that and think, oh, that's just clothes. It's where the clothes ain't that I'm interested in. We don't do that just because it's cool. It's cute. We want attention. We want people looking at us. As a saint, we don't do that. Somebody got a hand up? I thought... I thought I saw one. I have to deal more with that now than sisters, period. Because for some reason, it's easy for us to get it in our mind. As long as I ain't lusting after you, it doesn't matter. But I shouldn't be trying to cause others to lust after me. Now, you can't help it if you dress modest and somebody's looking. I mean, in some countries they wear clothes over their head, face, body, all the way down to their feet, and they still get husbands. So somebody interested even when they got a bag over them. They do. They get married. So I don't think completely covering yourself up makes a man not interested. But you shouldn't be completely uncovered trying to make them all interested. He said the Gentiles, talking about the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, when we walked around exposing ourselves, making people want to lust after us, we also lust. We also walked in excess of wine, getting drunk, reveling, banqueting, and fighting and brawling and drinking. What kind of behavior is that for saints? And then the ones, some of them just banqueting is something that I don't think most of us even think about. Is It could be wrong. Where they just hosting parties and eating in excess. He didn't say throwing a banquet, banquetings. You know what he said? Because some folks is all wrapped up in it and it's all about the social status and all of this kind of stuff. That's, that's wrong. We'll feed the governor and the mayor and all of theirs and we, throw, we are hosting a dinner for the, the mayor, our mayor, mayoral candidate or our governor candidate and we won't give a dime to feed anybody that's going without. Yes, sir. No, no, he said, I saw you saying t attending a Super Bowl party is banqueting. No, he is dealing specifically with those who are constantly having these social gatherings, dinner parties and that kind of stuff that are always having these large banquets for those that are well off but won't feed nobody else. And that's a bad thing, to, a bad position to be in. There are some that run for political office and, and that's what they're saying, what they'll, they'll tell you. If I can get into office, I'm gonna cut off welfare. I'll take the money from the poor. Yes, there are some abusers there are some people who just can't eat. We'll take that from them. Why would we take it from them? Because I want more money for myself. You trace it all the way back to its root. Love of money. I think we do pretty good. As a country, I think pretty much you could line our poor up against the poor in some third world country and they would gladly trade places with our poorest people because our poor folks got shelters they can go to, homeless, but they got shelters they can go to. When it drops down so cold that they can't sleep or die, they let them in, in the buildings, in the shelters, and let them sleep there. But in third world countries, they just find dead bodies because they froze to death and nothing they can do. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, you're right. He said they can go to jail. And there's some that do that. They intentionally go to jail just so they can stay warm and have something to eat. Because they know we'll do that. But in other countries, they don't have what we have. It's, it's easy to kind of lose track of it when you're used to having so much. But Americans are like spoiled children. We are. We have so much that even when we're poor, we got a problem. With how poor folks with cell phones. You see them? They're seriously, standing at the bus stop doing this. You, you pay money for them phones and for the plan to go with it. So we got enough for that. So poor, I can't afford a car. Can't buy a bicycle. But I can get me a phone. We have. We really do. A poor people, two, three TVs in our house. But we poor. Poor and got two cars. One raggedy and one not so raggedy, but still. But we got two. And we don't do too bad. One thing we have to do, though, if we want to be saved in the midst of all of that, which is really a problem, in the midst of all of that, we have to keep a level head. We have to be able to keep our mind on the fact that I'm trying to be holy and not like the world. Stand on your feet.